All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Andrea Shirk. It's June 17th, 2024. We're at the Portland Wine Storage in Portland, Oregon. Andrea, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. First question, why wine? Uh, why wine? Um, why wine? My story is sort of funny. I was, uh, I, was a, I was starting out as a jazz singer, and my parents were both singers, and were in show business, and I was um, going out to local clubs, and there used to be a club called Brasserie Montmartre here in Portland, and I went with my parents because I wanted to go and see all the jazz singers in town, and I saw these people in the distance, and they looked like Barbie and Ken, and they both had a huge goblet of red wine, and I said to my parents, I want to look like that. I don't know why. Like, why would I want to look like Barbie and Ken? <laughs> no idea, but I did. Like, I just thought that looked so cool. So I just said, I'll have a glass of red wine. So I just started drinking red wine everywhere we went. Of course, you can imagine how bad, because we're going to like jazz bars, and I'm drinking, and this is in the late 80s, or no, maybe, no, I'm sorry, maybe this is the mid 90s, like 92, something like that. And I'm drinking, you know, red wine from a bar, a jazz bar. So that's how I started drinking red wine. And it all kind of started from there. And then I, so I just, for, I knew it was an acquired taste, or that's what people said. So I would keep drinking red wine everywhere I went. And then I eventually, in my jazz singing career, um, started traveling and um, doing different kinds of shows and traveling around the world and living in different countries as a singer and doing musical theater and things like that. And um, I ended up living one, doing one show in South Africa, and so I would go, you know, try all the wines, and I, I was just starting to develop my palate. Um, and um, then I lived in, um, you know, I lived in Germany, so I explored those wines. I lived in different places in America, and I just, um, just was all starting to, like it all started from there, where I was just trying every wine I could try and reading every book I could, starting to read about wine. And I guess I, I kind of started my show business career late, so I knew, you know, it would only have a certain time frame. And I thought, well, I better have something to do when I'm 40, because I know this isn't going to last long. When I uh, got nodes in my vocal cords, as you can still hear them now, um, I had to stop show business, and I was about 40, mm -hmm. and um, I knew it was wine that I had to go to, and I didn't know what capacity I would do in wine, um, so I, start, I went back to school. I met my husband here, Tom Harvey, at Portland Wine Storage, and we decided to go back to school to the Chemeketa program and do the winemaking program. So we did that. Um, also during this time, I planted a small vineyard at my parents' property um, in southwest Portland, and I... I was still doing show business while I was working on my, planting my vineyard. So I was doing things and doing show business and, you know, still, I think I would come home for a while after a show and I'd stay here for three months and maybe take a class at Shebekata. Then I'd go back on the road and do another show and then I'd come back. Um, and so eventually I finally, and I met Tom and I had the nodes. So the time was to make the change from, you know, from show business to wine business. And that's kind of why wine, in a nutshell. So, so many more questions about that. We'll come back to that in a minute, though. Okay. Tell us a little bit about life before wine. Tell us about where you were born and raised and about kind of life up into show business. OK. Uh, well, I was born and raised in Portland. And my parents both singers and dancers. And um, so I, I went to college at U of O. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I kind of just did telecommunications and film because that seemed like the easiest thing to do. I kind of always knew in my head I wanted to sing. So then I, I, after college, I was in Portland a little while, couldn't really find my bearings as far as show business, and I moved to San Francisco, and I started working there with a vocal coach and a pianist, and I was just working in like retail cosmetics at Nordstrom. I mean, I, just, I had to get a job. So I think at this age, I'm like 24, 25. I became involved with Randy Jackson of American Idol, who is my boyfriend. Anyway, oh my God. that relationship for four years in San Francisco brought me back home. I said, I got to get out of there after four years of craziness. And um, so I landed here, and that's when I started hanging out with my parents and going to the jazz clubs and saying, I got I to gotta pursue this. This is really what I'm going to do. Yes, that's 
So that's that. Is that <laughs> and at some point you were a Madonna impersonator? Oh, yes, that's oh. later. Oh, that's later. Okay, we haven't gotten to that yet. No. Okay. My first show business job, I was, um, I saw an ad for a show, a review show for a singer in Japan. And I thought, uh, okay, I'll go to the audition. It was the first thing I came across. I remember driving around my little car and couldn't find a parking lot and like a parking space. I'm like, ugh, forget it. I'm, I'm going to try one more time. And I drove around one more time and someone pulled out and I got the spot. So I went and I got the job and that changed my life. Like if had I not, had that person not pulled out and I not pulled in, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'd be doing. So tell us, tell, us, tell us about the first job. So I got the job in Japan and I was a singer in a little review show. We were in a hot tub, um, a hot tub, <laughs> not a hot tub. We were not in a hot tub. We were, they called it an onsen spa hotel. It's like a family hotel where they have natural onsens, which are hot, hot springs. And then they have a little uh, theater where people eat dinner and watch the show. So that's what it was. It was just a, five girls five dancers, myself as a singer, and I danced also, because I grew up dancing as a child. So then I also, that show got me back into dancing, which was great, because then I renewed my whole dancing. I was also um, an elite gymnast, but when I was a kid. So that, that helped me with my career, actually. God, I forgot about that. That's like put me into, helped me in my show business, because I ended up doing a lot of dancing and acrobatic jobs, mm -hmm. aside from the singing. Mm -hmm. So, so before, before pivoting into wine, tell us a little bit about what show business meant for you. Where, what were some of the favorite jobs you remember, some of your, some of your kind of like standout? Uh, well, that first one was fantastic, right? Because we worked from 9 to 9.30. So I remember we would meet these English teachers and they're like, well, what do you guys work? And they're like, oh, we work like 9 to 9, you know? And like, well, we work 9 to 9.30, like, wow. You guys work nine to nine, nine in the morning to nine thirty at night. I'm like, no, no. We work nine at night to nine thirty at night. <laughs> and they're like, that's it. And we're like, that's it. And I remember thinking how lucky I was. I was doing a show, singing, dancing. Um, it was just so fun. And then they also, we would they would ask us, would you like to? There's a in the, in the Japanese culture, they have a thing where you can sit with. The, they request you to sit with them. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, that's weird. We don't want to do this. They're like, well, well, you get paid, so you'll get like if you order a drink, you'll get five bucks, and if you order food, you'll get eight bucks. And we're like, oh, okay. So we started doing it, and and it was actually amazing because we got to I. Well, I spoke Japanese. I don't really know, but I spoke. I ended up speaking Japanese all my jobs. I spent about ten years in Japan. I was pretty good in Jap Japanese by the time I, you know, ended my show business career, and met so many wonderful people and learned the culture and had so many great friends. And I wouldn't take a show unless it allowed us to sit with the customers because that was just like bonus money on top and just bonus like, cultural experience. Mm -hmm and learning the language and everything. I was getting paid for all of it. And it was just so fun. It's such an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. So that's probably like the highlight, going to Japan and loving Japan so much. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of other great, I did a cruise ship in, that went from Finland to Sweden. And we worked from midnight to 12.30, in the morning, you know, like half an hour on the ship and then all day and hung out in Finland. And then all day the next day I'd hung out in Stockholm and just, I could live in co coffee shops and write in my journal and paint to do, had all day to do whatever I wanted to do for many, many years. So it was, show business was good. <laughs> Did you have a, was there something in mind when you, when you started into the business, the business was, there a, was there a pinnacle or was there something you were kind of thinking about as like a, a goal or a, something you really wanted to do? I was really just happy to be making a living mm -hmm. as an actor, actress, as a singer. It was, you know, I was always, um, if I'm in a room of dancers, I'm the singer. If I'm in a room of singers, I'm the dancer. You know, because I was good at everything, but not great at anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I could do it all. I was a triple threat. I did the acrobatics. I did everything. But I wasn't like, you know, that star, star, star singer or that star, star dancer, right? Mm -hmm. But it was kind of good because I could, I could kind of do everything and do a lot of different variety shows. So you mentioned getting interested in wine kind of, kind of on, on a chance. Uh, tell me about developing your palate, developing your education. Before you kind of made the pivot into wine, how knowledgeable did you feel about wine and, and what was the, what kept you excited about learning about wine? Um, I guess probably because I was going to all these different countries and everything was so different and tasting these different wines and going to just different wineries around the world. Um, and then coming, the great thing also was coming back to Portland in between shows um, and also, I, we have a house, my family has a home in, in the Bay Area, so I would go back there sometimes as well. 
and we and just spending all my free time either reading about wine or tasting wines or just you know because I loved it so much and I just knew this is what I want to do when I'm done with show business I just was and I just I guess I just studied it you know a lot I read a lot of books and I knew at that time I think I wanted to try go for the masters of song, uh, master of wine mm -hmm. um, situation mm -hmm. but um, that kind of faded away <laughs> after I have a baby I can't remember anything so I'm like I can never remember that now <laughs> I did go through the first part, though. So let's talk about the, the pivot a little bit then. Uh, getting towards the end of show business career, uh, tell me about making the, kind of making the leap into wine. What was the, the first step? The first step was, let's see. The first step was I got, um, gosh, there's a couple different parallel things going on here. So I think it's good for anyone to just, if you don't know what you're doing or what you want to do, you just volunteer, right? So I went out on uh, sales calls with somebody. That was a nightmare. I hated that more than anything. I just, it was so hard and you wait in line to show your products. It wasn't even my own lines. It was just, you know, someone's portfolio. That is the hardest job. I have a lot of respect for those people that do that. Very tough. So I crossed that off. I'm like, well, I'm not doing that. Then I um, volunteered for the Indie Wine Festival. And that, I happened to get put on a committee with Rebecca Murphy who is also a mentor of mine, and she ran the Dallas Morning News wine competition. And she, I was on her committee to run the wine competition for the Indie Wine Festival. So I got involved in that, and that, while that was going on, I was still, um, I think at that point I was in classes in Chemeketa. Mm -hmm. So that was, I was learning how to make wine. Mm -hmm. I started doing harvest every year. Um, I guess my first one was, Gosh, 2005, um, and I did I did five harvests at Shea Wine Cellars, and that uh, that's where I met Drew Voigt of Harper Voigt, who's my total mentor. My, I, te I texted him this morning. I'm like, oh my God, do I do, do I need to do this if I do that? <laughs> he always answers me immediately. He's just the best mentor you could ever have. If I have any questions, I can call him and ask him. I mean, I feel like I can almost, I almost know all the answers, but you're always growing and you're always, you know, you're always not sure in some way, right? So anyway, um, he really helped me. Um, and every, you know, I didn't work the whole season. I just worked harvest. Because um, I think I was in school during the, during the year. Um, and then I ended up working for Rebecca at the Dallas Morning News Wine Competition. And there I met Will Goldring, who was the programmer who created the software um, for, um, it's called Enofile, mm -hmm. that runs wine competitions. And at the time, he was just doing her competition. Um, 20 years later, we have about 50 competitions, and it's just he and I. I do, he does the programming, and I do everything else, and that's my real job. <laughs> so, yeah, that was another really lucky thing. You know, I guess I'm just a, a lucky person. <laughs> I really don't have that much talent. <laughs> I mean, I'm just lucky. Well, tell me, tell me about Chemeketa and your experience. So you mentioned learning to make wine. That's different than sales, different than other things. Why that route? Why did you want to learn how to make it? I think because I, knew, I always wanted to make wine. I mean, I'm always trying to make wine with, from my little vineyard. And always, I, I think in my heart, that's what I wanted to do. Um, I'm also, you know, I was, I went from being like an, uh, I remember when I quit gymnastics, elite gymnastics, my mom's like, are you sure you want to quit gymnastics? Because, you know, you get a lot of attention. I know you like attention. <laughs> like, yes, I have to quit gymnastics, mother. I hate it. I'm ready to move on. Then, but then I went to show business. And so that gave me my fulfillment of whatever attention I needed to get. And then I think the avenue for wine with me was like, it was more being a winemaker. Because I guess for some reason that not only is it artistic, but, um, and I'm an artistic, more so an artistic person than a scientific person, for sure. So it had that avenue, and it also gave me some feeling of something, I just, a, a, a goal or a dream of mine that I wanted to, like I wanted to be a singer, and I did it. And I wanted to make wine, and I did, you know, and I never had an aspiration to sell wine, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> which is the problem now. Because <laughs> you can make it, you gotta sell it. <laughs> No one tells you that when you want to be a winemaker. Yeah, that would ruin the illusion. Exactly. 
<laughs> right. Before we continue down that, tell me about, you mentioned the vineyard. So tell me about putting a vineyard in and, and oh, well, how you went about that. Um, I just from the classes at Chemeketa, I learned, you know, how to, how to do it all. And it's only 50 vines. It's really small. Mm -hmm. You know, but it was really, it's a learning experience and I'm, it's a defeating experience because if you, you know, if it's not the bees, it's the raccoons. If it's not the raccoons, it's the birds. If it's not the birds, it's the gophers. If it's not the gophers, it's the deer. Mm -hmm. If it's not the deer, it's the weather. I mean, it's always something, right? And it, I just learned how defeating it is and I don't want to do it. <laughs> so that taught me that. So that, you know, I'm like, vineyard management, no. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. So you mentioned, I know we're going a little out of order here, but you mentioned meeting Tom and, do, and doing wine classes together. Tell me about meeting Tom and about how, like, starting the, I guess sort of starting the wine thing together. Um, well, we were in a tasting group here. Uh, five of us, Joe was involved and two of the other, uh, Sam Sunderleaf and Norm Schoen and Joe and Tom and myself had a tasting group and we would meet, I don't know, once a month and do whatever taste. We all, had collect, we all had collections, so we all stored our wine here, and that's how we all met. So we just somehow got together to have this tasting group, and I remember Tom and I would sit across from each other, and we just kind of became best friends. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know, I guess we've been married 18 years now almost. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that started. And then we, I mean, I think he was really good in, because I was at a career change, right? I, had, I couldn't sing anymore, my nodes, and I was 40. And I don't think I really wanted to, you know, the show, in the shows, I was, you know, well, that was when I was Madonna at the end. I was a Madonna and all the dancers and kids were like 20 and I was, you know, in my late 30s. And so I'm, it was fine until a while I was like, okay, I'm just now hanging out with 20 year olds and I, I'm ready to be done, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it was, I could still hang with those people, but it just, the time, it was, the time was right for me to move on. And then just meeting Tom, and he, he said, let's go back to school. I mean, I think it was, I knew I wanted to do it, but he, you know, he helped me and encouraged me to do that and for us to do it together, which was great because I don't do math. <laughs> and, and he helped me through all that um, horrible sobbing, trying to get through science and math, which was horrible. <laughs> but that's also because I, when I was a gymnast, I was taken out of school um, and I didn't, uh, in eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade, I didn't, I had two classes in the morning, English and something else. I don't remember what it was, maybe history. And then my mom picked me up at 11. I was in gym until six o'clock. I never had math in, in middle school. Do they allow that? I mean, it seems so illegal, right? And I study, I'm still paying for it now. You know, like it, it, even when I have to do calculations, I'm like, oh, Tom, can you help me? It's just so brutal for me. That should be illegal. I should sue somebody. <laughs> I don't know who. Maybe Portland Public. <laughs> I mean, I ain't got any money. <laughs> so you're uh, actually I can't I can't let the Madonna thing pass. Though. Okay. I'm asking a question about Madonna. How did you end up as a Madonna impersonator? Okay. Where did it take you? Oh, okay. I'll make that one quick. I was so I was doing review type shows. I was doing musical theater, like a lot of musical theater here in Portland. I did shows at Lakewood, and I did shows in San Francisco, and then I um, I had gone to Biloxi, Mississippi as a dancer. And the guy hired me because he said, I, you sing and you dance, and I think you look like Madonna. I'm like, really? I go, okay, all right. So I went on, I went to this show, and there I met the Madonna. I was a dancer in her show, in this one Madonna show. And she, um, she trained me, and she was just a great person, generous with her knowledge. And she helped me get my act together. And oh, the whole, the reason I took the job was my mom came home from the grocery store right when this was going, this guy was offering this job. She said, there's someone on cover of Vogue that looks exactly like you. I'm like, who? She's like, I don't know who it is. It's just her, it's just this part of her face. I'm like, okay. So I went, um, got the thing, was Madonna. And you couldn't really even tell me, it didn't really look like Madonna because it was just this part of me, you can see her blonde hair. I'm like, okay, I guess I gotta say hi, yes to this guy because my mom just said I looked like this lady in the cover book, it's Madonna. So I said, yeah, I'll take the job. So that was how that started. And then I just, and then I remember him saying like, well, why would I want to do that? Seems kind of like a sellout to me. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, because as a dancer, you're making 400 bucks a week and as Madonna, you make a <laughs> thousand. And you don't have to be a dancer in all the shows. You do one 20-minute show and you're done. I'm like, okay, <laughs> there we go. 
So I started doing that and I just went from, you know, job to job and that was um, similar to being a dancer and a singer, but just I was Madonna at that point. Um, and I think probably the craziest thing I did was I was in Berlin working in a show in Berlin when Madonna was actually there. And so I got hired for all these jobs that she wouldn't do, like radio things. So this one job, they, they had me dress up as Madonna, of course, in my costume and everything. And they had um, all these Russian bodyguards and we had like 10 limousines. And they put me in the limousine <laughs> And they, we had to go to this area, it's called Kumsterdam or something, I guess a very popular, trendy area. And we drove through and, I'd, and they announced it on the radio that Madonna would be coming through the Kumsterdam and picking out people. You have to dance for her and they're picking out people to get show tickets. So I was literally like, I drove in my costume, I rolled down the window a little bit, you know, in the limousine and people were crazy, like they were dancing, they were doing, and then I'd say, okay, that one. And I'd just point, and then they would go and give the ticket to the show to that, per whoever it was. It caused such a traffic thing in the whole city that we ca the car couldn't even move, and then we heard, heard police sirens starting to come, and they're like, wait, we gotta get out of here, and they're all talking, you know, German and everything, I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? Then we started just speeding like crazy, and I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna die like Princess Di, and I'm not even famous, like I'm not even Madonna. Anyway, that was a wild experience. Kind of made me realize like what these people go through and how actually horrible it is. You know, like that is really crazy. Anyway, that was probably the most interesting uh, experience as Madonna. But people also the way, the way people would treat you um, was weird. Like I mean, as an impersonator, right? I wasn't Madonna, so I'm not famous. But they would say, oh, can I have your autograph? Or, you know, like they, I was just crazy how people can't relate, I guess, to, not that I'm any kind of celebrity whatsoever, but just their image of a celebrity would make them react, uh, be, they'd be nervous or, you know, it was weird. Such a luring experience to experience a glimmer of what maybe her life is like. Check that off, there's no thanks. <laughs> Right there with vineyard management. Right there with the vineyard management. Uh uh. <laughs> so that's that's how the whole. I did, and then I did that for. I did, but I was in Madonna for about ten years. Yeah, and that was really really great. I mean, it was just super fun, you know. I'm I'm amazed that there's that much demand for Madonna impersonators. Oh yeah. I mean, we would do corporate shows like we would do Merrill Lynch, Beaver Creek, Colorado, where all these we stayed in this fantastic place for all summer, we did one show every three weeks. And we lived there, all, me and Michael Jackson impersonator, Stevie Wonder, Bruce Springsteen, Elton John, all of us. And then, you know, 30 dancers. I mean, it was just like complete, so fun. And just, just a great, I mean, you know, what a life, right? But you can't live that life forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing. Okay, so yeah, so there's definitely. I mean, there's corporate events, there's regular shows, there's cruise ships, there's you know, I did them all. So I feel I feel almost bad talking about wine. No, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> so wine, what's that? So you're in. So you're in. You're Chemeketa, and you're trying a lot. You're trying a lot of things, and you're finding that wine making is something that is yeah. that is speaking to you. So tell me about as you're kind of wrapping up, as you as you as you're getting into wine making, what. Are you, do you have, do you, are you starting to make a plan? Or is there a goal for yourself? Is there something that you really want to do with winemaking? I mean, I think when I, once I started working at Shea and I met Drew, well, I, get, I think once I started making, working at Shea, I knew I wanted, that was what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. for sure. Because I had checked the other things off. Mm -hmm. um, and I was still at this time, I think, no, I wasn't quite working for Enofile yet. That was in 2008. This is around 2005 when I started my first harvest. So I just knew, um, I didn't know how I was going to get the opportunity. And I, I also knew I kind of didn't want to like, I didn't want to run, run, run the big show. Like I didn't want to do what Drew, Drew was doing. Way too much responsibility. <laughs> Way too much information. Like, you know, you had to know all about the vineyards and all about everything and, you know, uh, compliance. And I was not interested in any of that. Um, and then... Drew um, left Shay and went on to start his own thing uh, where he was doing um, Custom Crush. And he's like, here's your chance. You want to start your own label. 
And then by that time, that was, I guess, 2012 now, so we've jumped time. And by that time, I was ready to start my own label. And that was when I started, we started Laylapse. So yeah, that was 2012. And we made 12, 13, 14 at Beacon Hill with Drew. And so he really helped me and guided me. And then we moved, in 2015, we moved to Southeast Wine Collective. Um, because at that point I had a child. And the commute was just, I didn't want to do that commute at all. You know? So, and then we ended up at Southeast Wine Collective, and I feel, I kind of feel like an outlier in the wine community because we're not really in the valley, you know, we're, and I kind of, I don't know, I kind of missed that at first, but then once I started getting into the urban wine scene, I, you know, it's, we got our own community here too, which is great. Um, and I, I, I just never had an interest in that commute. And plus I'm not, it's not my, I mean, our winery is our, a business, but it's not, I also, my, my paying job <laughs> is Enofile, the wine competition software. So that was... And all of us who are um, involved in Laylax, Laylap's project, which are, there are four now, um, we all have other jobs. Mm -hmm. So it was important to stay in Portland and not move to the valley and be an urban winery. We liked it too. We liked the scene of the urban wineries. We just, more, it's just kind of more my scene, mm -hmm. you know, all of our scene. So between starting to make wine and thinking you don't want to run the show and making and then starting your own label, what was the growth for you? What, was, what, what were the steps along the way? What made you think it was time in 2012 that you were ready to do it? Um, well, I had actually been making, we had been, as a group, as a tasting group where I met Tom, we'd been making wine since 2005. So I was getting grapes from Shea then, making uh, one barrel of wine um, since 2005. So I was, by 2012, I, was, I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I was pretty ready. And then I was doing, and then once we were starting with Drew, then I just, you know, any questions I had, he was right there. So three years of that, then I was really ready to be on my own. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, I still text him for questions. <laughs> so tell us about starting Lay Laps then. Uh, first of all, I guess, what was sort of the mission? What were you, what were you trying to make with Lay Laps? Um, well, with all of us, we all wanted to make the kind of wine we wanted to drink. It's really what we wanted to do. And I always wanted to make something that, um, well, I mean, we love cabs. I'm a real, Sam and I, that's one of our partners, we, we love, we wanted to, you know, we love California cabs. So we kind of wanted to make something like that. Um, we knew we all, we wanted to stick all in Oregon. So our, our, our sort of thing is we're all Oregon, all single vineyard, all single varietal. So every wine we make is from a single vineyard. It, there's no blends, it's all solid, 100% Cabernet, 100% Pinot Noir, 100% Riesling. Um, and all Oregon. So the Cabernets are from Eastern Oregon in uh, Rocks District of Milton Freebotter and also Walla Walla. Um, and then the Pinot um, from Lamp Valley and Riesling from Lamp Valley. Next, so, so tell us, tell us about, about the name and about, about uh, making your first wine, first professional wine. The name, okay, so Lay Lap, so our tasting, do uh, tasting group name was Mad Dog, M-A-D-D-O-G. I can't tell you the first part because it's really nasty. <laughs> downtown, blank, 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 downtown enological group. <laughs> so we knew we had to have a dog in the name or a dog somewhere because we, we couldn't come, no one could use their own name because there were five of us at the time. So we'd like, well, what? We didn't know. And Drew was like, you gotta make a decision. You gotta get your labels. It's time to decide. So Tom was flying back from the East Coast and he was sitting next to a, what's that, mythology? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> mythology professor. And, the, and he was talking about how we need a name, a dog, or something. And then he's like, well, how about Laylaps? And Tom's like, well, who's Laylaps? <laughs> so, well, Laylaps was the dog that Zeus, um, Zeus created this dog that was a perfect dog. He always caught its prey. And then he got really bored with the dog always catching its prey. So he threw in a fox that could never be caught. So the fox and the dog ran around in like a Mobius circle, perfect and imperfect at the same time. So we sang that story and, and we're like, wow, that's kind of like a metaphor for wine, kind of. That's kind of good, but no one knows Laylaps and no one can say it and people are gonna say labia and shit like that, you know? <laughs> My friend still calls it the labia wine. <laughs> anyway, but we're like, well, that's what we got, so that's what we're going with. So that's, that's how Laylaps came to be. 2012, oh my God, come on, it's, it's a long time ago. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> 2011 was the only vintage I hadn't made since 2005 because I had a daughter that year. 2012, that's we made the Rocks Cabernet. 
that to this day is one of the best wines we've made and drinks fantastic, fantastically still. Um, and we were blown away by that wine. We're like, wow, this is a great, this is great wine. This, this, there's something here, so we got to stick with this rocks stuff. But then we actually lost the rocks um, in the next vintage, so we didn't make it for a couple more vintages. But anyways, and then we made a, um, got lucky with a Pinot, Sam, who owns Sunderleaf Painting, got a job painting Diane um, Nemarnicki's, um, the Nemarnik. So he got a job painting, she hired him to paint something. He's like, hey, she's got a vineyard, she's a great vineyard. I'm like, it turns out her, her brother lives next to the house I grew up in, my mom still lives in. He, I'm John, I'm like, that's your brother, John? I'm, that's my neighbor, I'm, you know, from childhood. Anyway, not childhood, but growing up at my, my mom's house. Anyway, we ended up getting her grapes, which were, it was right at the beginning of her start, and they were fantastic. And Daru, I remember Daru was like, well, you don't know anything, there's no history of this vineyard, you don't know anything about it, maybe you should get grapes from somewhere else. And I'm like, no, we're gonna try this. And I remember them saying, wow, your wine is the best wine here this year. And that was 2012, and we're like, wow, okay, great. Again, lucky. <laughs> so we actually made Pinot, uh, that first year we made Pinot and Cab, and that was it. Um, we brought in Riesling later from Anime Vineyards. Um, I think 2017 was our first vineyard for Riesling, uh, year, vintage for Riesling. Um, and then with the rocks, uh, we made the rocks, and we also, when we lost the rocks in 2013, we moved to the hillside, Seven Hills, which actually has been a fantastic, makes a fantastic wine. That's our Seven Hills Vineyard Cabernet. We love that wine so much. And then we got an opportunity, again, to make the rocks. So we're like, you know what? Let's make two cabs. We're gonna make a, a Seven Hills from the hillside, and that makes a really silky, velvety, more California style, opulent cab, and then we're gonna make the rocks, which makes a more austere, kind of minerally, more Bordeaux-style, earthy cab. Um, and they're two very different wines, and they're about 200 yards from each other. It's amazing. One's, you know, in the gravel, one's on the hillside. Um, so we, those are our, like our two main wines. The Pinot, we let go after COVID. We actually, during COVID, I said, ooh, let's not do Pinot. What, yeah, this is kind of scary. L luckily, not luckily, but lucky for us, that was the year of the fires. We had backed out before the fires even came, so we never made a, the COVID year fire vintage. And then we never went back because we just thought, well, let's just focus on our cabs. Um, we also eventually lost the Riesling, but I got another Riesling back this year. So this year we'll be making two cabs and a Riesling. And we probably won't, we just felt like the Pinot market's over saturated, hard to sell. We loved it, we loved our Pinot. We still have a great, 2019 was my last vintage, I love it. It's beautiful, elegant, fantastic, but, and I'm kind of sad I'm not making it, but I don't know, I think there's so much Pinot out there. And I think that Oregon Cab is such an undiscovered, unbelievable, fantastic product that um, that needs to get out there. The word needs to get out. Tell me about your winemaking style and I guess how it started and if it has evolved. Well, it's, it, I mean, I'm a product of Drew Voigt. <laughs> <laughs> I am not shy. My, my goal as a winemaker is to make a balanced product. I really want to make a balanced product and, and I want it at a price point that people can afford. Um, that being said, it's not cheap, but it's not expensive, right? Our cabs are 45 and 50. Um, our Pinot was 37, which is incredibly reasonable for a single vineyard Pinot in Oregon. Um, so we kept, you know, we, we, I wanted to be approachable. I hate it when, you know, regular people can't afford to buy the wine. It's just seemed so wrong. Um, but as a winemaker, it, it was all, a, it's all about balance, right? If my, and I, I, I like to, give some hang time. So if you give some hang time, you get very ripe fruit. And so, you know, you have to make some adjustments and I'm willing to make those adjustments. Um, and I think to make the balanced, balanced product, you have to make those adjustments. So if you want to get full ripeness, you got to make those adjustments. If you want to pick early and not get full ripeness and not have to add acid or anything like that, that's a different product. And that's great too, but it's just not, that's not my style. My style is a bigger style but a balanced style. So I'm not looking for huge, huge alcohol. My alcohols are in the 14, high 14s. Um, I am, 
but it, they're, they're ripe. Um, they're never underripe, although sometimes the rocks doesn't quite ripen as much as I like, and I like those vintages as well. And I actually am, I guess the evolving is, I'm liking those lower alcohol wines. And so I'm kind of moving the rocks because it doesn't ripen as much as the Seven Hills every year. I'm moving more toward that being, you know, I guess, more like a Bordeaux wine, a little lower alcohol, European style. And then the, keeping the, the other one, letting it get super ripe, keeping that 14.9 alcohol, bringing the rocks down to 13.5 around there. So it, 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 I think what's happened in the years is those wines have separated a little bit. You know, like you used to make them exactly the same, but now with one coming in a li not as ripe as the other, you know, they've become, they're two different wines. You mentioned the project started with four or five of you together. Uh, tell me about the, that kind of group making process. How, how, are, how are responsibilities split up? Um, well, I, I do the wine making and um, we all do harvest. We all do the production at harvest. We all take turns doing punch downs. We all are there processing, meticulously sorting our fruit. We're all involved in that. Um, that's a requirement for everybody. And then um, Sam became the cellar master because he just knows, you know, he owns a painting equipment. He just, he learned just because we had to do it, right? And I, you know, I learned about equipment. I worked at Shea, but I wouldn't, I am not technically savvy. So Sam is, he can just instinctually know, you know, he can measure the diameter of a tank. I don't know how to do that. It's math. <laughs> he's just, he's really good. So he's been our cellar master and he and I mostly work together um, at the at the winery. Um, he comes in for the bigger projects, like we just did a rack and return yesterday, and he, he and I do those together. I do all the, make all the decisions about the winemaking and stuff. Um, Tom will help, because he knows how to make wine as well, but he has this job here, so he doesn't have the time that anyone else has either. Well, Joe, when Joe was part of it, he did most of our compliance, mm -hmm. and now Norm kind of does that, and Norm does all the design, Norm's an architect, so he does like, <laughs> You know, he's involved in the labeling and the capsules and all, he does all that kind of stuff. And we all do sales. We all do events. No one's out there pounding the pavement, though. So no one has time for that, unfortunately. <laughs> so you mentioned selling wine a couple of times. It's clearly not, clearly not your favorite part of the process. So no. tell, me, tell me about selling wine, especially when it's not your full-time gig. Um, well, we do some events. You know, we try to do all the events we can. The collective, well, it's called the Wine Yard now. It's moved. Mm -hmm. um, and we do the events every third Thursday of an event. We, we sell wine there. We, we all have connections in our, you know, like Tom and Joe have connections here, Portland Wine Source, so we t sell some people here. Sam uses a lot of stuff in his business. Um, we are in some, we're, we're in market of choice, and that's been a really solid account for us. We're in all of them, even in Bend. That's a really, really good solid account for us. So that kind of, that's our bread and butter. Um, and then we, before covered, we were in a few restaurants, but we just haven't revisited that. I think I went back to one and they and said, hey, you know, you guys used to, Q, they used to sell our wine a lot. She's, and it was right after COVID, and she's like, we're still, we're sitting on a lot of inventory. So I thought, oh, you know, maybe I'll wait a year or two to start visiting restaurants. Mm -hmm. So we just do, we do have events here. We sell direct. We do whatever kind of events we can. I mean, we're small. We make 350 cases. Well, not even that now. This year we made 150 cases. It used to be that uh, the max was 350. Now we're down to two lots of Cabernet, 150. And we're adding the Riesling back, so that'll be 225. So we're super small. Mm -hmm. But you still got to get out there and sell it, right? Like. Might be even harder when it's small because it's like ah, it's only two hundred cases. Right, it'll be fine. Yeah. You mentioned Oregon Cab as a sort of an un, 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 unknown thing, and I, I'm curious. I'm curious about market reaction to an Oregon Cabernet. What do you have to do a lot of convincing? Are people excited to try it? I mean, they just don't. They don't. You know, no one thinks about it, right? They just think about an Oregon Cab, and <clears throat> kind of interesting with the rocks when in fifteen and sixteen vintages. Um, when we were on our, we were finally on our own at the collective, and I remember I was going to go and top up some wine. I'm like, oh, we just had got that wine back from the bottler, and I'm like, I'll just use this to top up with, you know, open a couple bottles, whatever. And I opened it and I tasted it. And I'm like, holy shit, that I, 
did I make that wine? I couldn't believe I made that wine. I mean, honestly, I couldn't believe I made that wine. I'm like meticulously studying my notes of what I did to do, what did I do, I gotta repeat this, how, you know, what you learn, you can never repeat. Everything is different every year, so that, that didn't really work. It made me realize this is, this is an, it was from the rocks. It was an unbelievable wine that had everything. The structure on that wine, I was like, I can't use this for top. This wine, it has so much structure and depth and layers. And I was just blown away by what it, and I thought, this is so sad that no one really knows about it. And then the rocks, uh, rows that we were using, they decided to rip those out and put Syrah in there because Syrah is doing so well. In the, and I thought, you know what, no one, and see, most of the wineries on the rocks are Washington wineries, so they can't label their wines as rocks. Only the Oregon wineries there can label them as the rocks. So they're taking those, that cab and just blending it in with their Walla Walla Valley cab. They're not focusing on this rocks cab, which is amazing, you know? Um, I felt like no one knew. Like, this is like the greatest secret around. Like, oh my God, how, you know? Anyway, so they, we have switched rows, and the row is different now. And I always say it takes 10 years to learn, learn a vineyard or learn a row. So I'm, I'm on my, about my fourth year now of this new row, learning this new row and how to make the kind of wine I, wine I want to make from that row. Um, so it's good. It's still good. It's different. Uh, this, is the, this is now it doesn't ripen as well as the other row did. So I'm, you know, I'm just learning um, how to do, how to, make the wine from the less ripe thinner, and it's kind of going along with the lighter alcohol too, which is good. Kind of a trend, I think, in, in the wine industry in general, right? Like lower alcohol. Yeah. I, I also made a piquette just for fun, which is like a 8%, and that was fun to make, because all I was, I had to go out to Apollonia for a couple of years while the collective moved spaces, and there were kids making wine there. Young kid, you're his age. <laughs> And they were all making piquette, and it sucked. I'm like, oh my god, I can make that so much better. <laughs> so I did. It was good, but I didn't make it commercial. I just did it fun. But it was great because it was like a. If I just wanted a glass of wine and not to feel anything, it was like I don't know. I never measured the alcohol. I'm mean, guessing it was around eight percent. And you can just have a glass of that, and you could drink that whole bottle, and you'd be fine. You know. So I, I, I like that idea of that. Might ex might explore that more in the future. It'll be a nice. Contrast with with a cab. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. You mentioned the kind of finding the urban wine scene here. So tell me a little bit about sort of your initial impressions of the Portland wine scene and how it has grown since you've been with it. Hmm. I'm probably not the best person to ask about that because um, I was at the Collective, and so when we were at the Collective, that was a great setup because they had the restaurant there, and we would just sell out every year just from that restaurant. We didn't actually have to sell when we were at the collective. Um, so that was a really great situation for a few years. And then of course, you know, they moved to the wine yard. They have a different setup now. But um, so I was only really, I wasn't having to do events with urban wineries or things like that. I was just at the collective. And then we were out of Apollonia for two years. So I was kind of out of the urban wine scene. I just now moved back this last vintage 23 to the wine yard. And I joined PDX Urban Wineries. Um, and I'm just, so I'm just starting to get involved in that group and get to know it. I can't really speak about it yet because I don't yet know. But we had an event, it was good, everyone seems great, you know. Um, I imagine they're similar to me, they just want to be urban, they want to stay, you know, either they have family or kids are here that are in schools here or they have other jobs that are here. Um, I know one guy I, can't, I met, I can't remember his name, but he was at, saw him at um, El Gaucho. So, you know, people, I think probably a lot of the urban wine people have other focuses as well, maybe more so than people in the valley, valley. But that does not mean that the wine is compromised at all. I mean, people are doing great things, you know? Tell me about getting to know a vineyard. You mentioned it takes 10 years to know a row or know a vineyard. What is the process like for you of getting to know a, a, a row or a vineyard? God, I don't know how to explain that. So, well, for example, in the rocks, let's just say in the rocks. Everyone talks about the rocks funk. So one year, I didn't experience that for a few years, any kind of funk or whatever. So then, uh, I guess it maybe was like 2017, I think. And on day two, it's my fermenter smelled like hay. Oh my God, it smells like hay. So I, of course I called Drew. Drew, it smells like hay. What the hell is it? 
is it, what is it? He's like, wow, that's weird. I've never heard that. But he's like, reduction? I'm like, oh, maybe. And you know, there's a gazillion, reduction can express itself in a gazillion different compounds. So I thought, I'm going to treat this like reduction. And I did, and I got rid of it. And you, like most, I don't know, most people wouldn't think that that would be, it was hay, it wasn't your typical rotten egg or whatever you get from H2S, you know, it wasn't typical what you would get. And I mean, it literally tasted like, smelled like a bale of hay. It was so bizarre. The next year was the same thing, you know? And I, you know, I learned how to deal with it. So that's just an example of you learn, um, no, not that I got the hay every year though. Like I haven't had the hay in a couple of years, you know, but I've had other kinds of reduction. So I tend to get more reduction from the rocks than I do from the hillside. Uh, the Seven Hills hillside, it's a guarantee ripe. I, I, I'm guaranteed to ripen. I don't have to worry about that or um, I, I'm, I know the vineyard manager now for, you know, many, many years. She knows my style. She knows I want to wait to the end. She, one time she called me, she's like, Andrea, you're not going to have pickers because they're going to pick Christmas trees next week. <laughs> you need to come pick your grapes. That's some hang time. That's some hang time. So, you know, I, I, learn, I know that the Seven Hills Vineyard, what that fruit's going to do. That's a solid. The rocks is a little more iffy, and especially since it's new now again. I'm only, you know, four years in. Um, so sometimes it ripens, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I'm close, sometimes I'm there, sometimes I'm not. Um, and I guess the same thing with Pinot, you know, I mean, well, Pinot's a whole different thing. <laughs> anyway, just, I don't, I, it's hard for me to explain what I mean. It's just to really make the wine you want to make. It just takes time to learn that, not only the vineyard, but just your processes, I guess. It's not only the vineyard, but, it, but like when you hear someone say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get some Carmenere this year and make Carmenere this year. I'm like, okay, well, that wine will be good in about 10 years. <laughs> you know, I mean, I really... I don't have patience for people who are kind of not focused and making cabs in Carmenere, Aligote, da, 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 you know, and I think, ah, that you kind of, kind of don't have any focus, right? Like, because I know how long it takes to make a great wine. I know it's a years of figuring it out, right? And then, you know, yeah, sure, you could maybe make a great wine that year, you know. Yeah, if you're a good winemaker, yeah, you can make a good wine. But to really make a great wine, right, you got to know it. So um, that was part of our thing, too. We just, like, focusing, really focused on what we're doing uh, on, on the cabs. And that being really our, our, our main focus as cabs. And, we lo and, and Riesling, too, because we love Riesling. All of us love Riesling, you know. And I've converted so many people to Riesling, right? They're like, oh, I don't want to taste it. It's sweet. I'm like, it's not sweet. It is not sweet. <laughs> and so many people I have changed. It's like, it's like the, the winemaker's grape. It is the winemaker's grape. I feel like. Yeah. Because the public is so misled by bad Riesling, right? There's so much bad Riesling out there with the non-winemakers making Riesling <laughs> or shitty winemakers making Riesling or just people making sweet Rieslings and not balancing it out. And then they taste that and they're like, ew, that's just sweet, you know. It's not. It's not. It doesn't have to be. And, and, and if it is sweet, you got a lot of acid in there to balance it and then it's juicy, not sweet. And that's what you want. You mentioned Pinot, of course, being its own challenge. Obviously, Pinot and Cab, so different in so many ways, and, and Riesling also. Uh, what's the, how, how you approach them differently when you were making all of them? How did you approach them differently? What is, what is sort of the, the philosophy behind Pinot versus the philosophy behind Cab for you? Well, your philosophy is always kind of the same if you want to make a balanced, structured wine. Um, so really, that's kind of the, you got the same goal. Um, Pinot, I don't think... I, my la the last one I made, I really, um, at first my goal in pe making Pinot was to make a big, big Pinot because I'm a cab drinker. So I'm trying to make a, plus I'm a product of Drew. So he made big Pinots and I loved his Pinot. So I wanted to make a big Pinot. So that was my focus initially. Um, I have obviously learned you can't always make a big Pinot every year. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> But it's, you know, ironically, the last vintage I made was probably my favorite in 2019 when it was a super light. We had to pull, they were getting decimated on the vine. And we had to pull them in early. And I did an extended maceration on that. First time I'd never done it before. I tried it. And that wine is so beautiful and so aromatic and so lovely and nuanced. 
I'm like, oh, if I were still making Pinot, that's what I'd want to make. Not those other vintages that are big, huge Pinots. So that's, I guess, I evolved, you know, in that. And then the same with the rocks. You know, I'm making the lighter style cab as opposed to the bigger style in the Seven Hills. There's so many variables, right? The ripeness, styles, you know. I guess now, Pinot, I mean, if I were making Pinot, I would go for the lighter style. I might, I'd be picking a little earlier, but I'm not making Pinot anymore, so. So you're talking about different approaches, different groups. So my, my curiosity is obviously like cab is, you know, big and tough and like you can beat it up and Pinot is so delicate. Yeah. I'm curious about just sort of getting used to that as a winemaker, getting used to having to handle things differently. Well, I guess in Pinot, you know, you need to get, I mean, you know, as a winemaker, you're always evolving and learning, but as in Pinot, you're trying to get extraction, right? Because you're not into the great, the thin, thinner skin and just trying, you know, lighter gray. So I, I was trying to get extraction from that. Cab, you don't really have to work that hard to get extraction, right? But this year, <laughs> I did a little longer of a cold soak on my cab. And this is just an example of learning something. And I don't even know, I have to take a lot of years to learn this. Um, I'm loving my 23 cab now from the Seven Hills. Guys, it's super tannic, and it's that has never been tannic before. It's never been that tannic. I'm like, well, what did I do differently? Well, I did a longer cold soak. Maybe it's that. Maybe not. I don't know. Got 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 to wait a few years to find out. But so um, I used to think that you really didn't have to do a cold soak or anything on the cab to get extraction. So, but I think you 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 can do different things to get more or less. Right? Um, so I kind of treated, I, in the past, I kind of treated everything similarly, because I like extracted. But then I changed at the end of the Pinot to not so extracted. And, and I'm changing now, like I said, in the, in the rocks to not as extracted. So, you know, maybe my, maybe my next year I will do a you know, two-day cold soak and a longer cold soak on the Seven Hills, because I like that one super extracted. In the rocks, I want less extraction. Um, not that the cold soak is going to make all that difference. There's other, other things as well, right? Let's talk about the other part of your wine life a little bit. Tell, tell us about Unifile. You mentioned oh. uh, kind, of a, kind of a happenstance of meeting. Yeah, uh, Will. What, was your, what, what is your role there? And give us an example of some of the ki kinds of things you've done. Well, my role at the Dallas Morning News was I was, I had gone, I did go to the um, WSET school and got the first level of that. Um, and I'd been, you know, like I said, I'd been reading about wines and studying wines for years. Um, and so she, Rebecca hired me to be like the quality control person. So I would make sure the right wine was in the right place at the right time. I would make sure that, that you know, you'd see something odd, like be a residual sugar, a little bit of residual sugar on a wine that was in a dry category. So you'd have to do, investigate and like then move that to the right category. This is all done in the software program. So I would go through the program and find oddities and then go out on the, in the setup of the competition and find the wines and examine the wines. And so I was just in charge of kind of making sure the right wine was in the right category. Um, and that was my whole job there. And I loved it. It was fantastic. And then I started doing wine. Then I started, well, then Will was like, hey, you live in Portland? Because we were in Dallas when we met. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, you want to work for me? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like a real job because this is right after show. You know, this is like 2008. I think, I think um, my last show business job was 2002. But then I was in school and stuff. So I'm like, wow, I don't really have a job. So okay. So then I started working with him, um, and then I also started getting to know other competitions, and our, our his business started to grow, and then I met um, Adam Levy, who runs the New York International Wine Competition. I started working for him. I would go to New York and run that whole competition. He'd sent me to Berlin to run the competition in Berlin. Um, so I just started, then I started judging. I started, uh, the Chronicle started using our software. So I said, oh, I want to judge that competition. So I was like, okay, come down and judge. So I started getting in the judging circuit. So now I'm judging wine competitions, which is super fun. You know, it's just great. It's, I love it. So it's a whole different side of wine, right? It's like the wine competition side of, uh, of wine. Um, and that, uh, you know, I'm basically, my job is to help the competitions get set up and I help enter, you know, wineries, you know, understand how to use the software and help competition managers learn how to use the software. 
so it's a it's great. It's like two hours or two hours a week. It's my job. <laughs> lucky, lucky. It pays the bills. <laughs> Tell us about wine judging. Obviously, an interesting, uh, interesting trick. So, tell me about getting yourself, preparing yourself to do that. I guess and, and handling uh, it. Yeah, that's um, that's a great. It's a great gig actually, and it's really interesting and really a learning experience. Um, so, I just got in because I asked the Chronicle, "Can I come and judge?" You know, and and plus, I had been organizing these. I'm working with Becky and seeing how it works and you know, and seeing the judges, and I've always been on the back end of things, but then when judging the Chronicle, I was on the front end of things, and realizing, like, with the judges, like, oh, God, I know more than these judges, so then, like, that, that element of being nervous was done, like, I'm like, no, I'm not, like, <laughs> these some of these people don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, a lot do, don't get me wrong, a lot do, but some don't. Um, so, yeah, that's a really, uh, you know, it's, I've been on good, I judge every year at Cal Expo, it's California State Fair. And we really, for our panels, are, the panel I've been on, we kind of the similar people, same people, we're, are, we really were like, yeah, we, we agree on things. So we, we feel solid in our decisions of these wines that we're giving gold medals to or whatever. But then, you know, I hang out with all the people and afterwards they're like, oh my God, so, someone gave a gold medal to a wine that was, you know, at VA or whatever. So you're like, oh God. What is that person doing judging here? You're like, you know, <laughs> there's some of that, but hopefully those wines don't make it all the way through. Flawed wines, you know, like they don't, they'll get cut off at a certain point, right? Like someone will catch that wine. So I, I do respect the process. I think the process does work if you have the right judges. You know, I don't, can't speak for every co competition because I'm not doing every competition, but, and there's a lot of them out there. There's like 50 use our software. So that business is really good, you know? And, you know, my boss, Will, he started with just one Dallas Morning News. And he's like, hmm, I think I can turn this into a business. And he sure did. So take me through the process of sitting down in front of a bunch of wines and judging them. What, what is your process like? How do you handle it? Um, well, when I organize competitions, I do not put more than six wines down in front of you. Because if you put eight or ten, th these wines don't get a chance, the wines at the end. They, they just don't get a chance. So my process is I smell through everything first and I take a note. And then, then, then I go around again, and I, I don't look at my note. I create a new note in my head, and then I look and see, make sure it matches the note that I had by the, the, the smell. Um, and, then I, and then I go through and taste. Um, and you know, I'll go back, and I won't just focus here. I'll go here, and then I'll maybe go over here, and go over there, and switch it up. Um, and then I'll push away the ones, immediately the ones that are flawed. I just put away. And I don't revisit, because I can spot out a flawed wine. And then you'll have the ones that you like, and then the ones that you're not sure about. So you have like three tiers, you know? So the ones you really like, the ones you're not sure, and the ones that are flawed. Mm -hmm. And then you just, you know, you just take the time to go through them. Um, and, and, and it, you know, it's, it's really good to have a winemaker on the panel. A, you, you know the flaws, but B, you really, you feel for these people who entered this wine. Like, I know how much work it took, how hard they worked to get this wine in here, right? And I'm going to give it time to, you know, I'm going to focus on this each wine and give, you know, respect every single wine that's entered, even if some of them shouldn't be entered. <laughs> Sometimes I'll be like, what was that winemaker thinking? Like, how could they enter this wine? Like, you, get, you see those, you know, and you're like, oh, I can't, if it's a flawed wine, it's no metal. You know, mm -hmm. for me anyway. But it's a fun, it's a, it's a great gig. So let's talk about the Oregon wine industry a little bit. I'm curious about, on a larger scale, um, your kind of initial impressions of, of Oregon wine and, and how you've seen the industry grow, just from your perspective. Um, well, you know, when I started out, I mean, it's, I was at Chemeca in 2005, and I remember people who now who have vineyards and are winemakers, and everybody in my class has late their own label. You know, like Barking Frog and the De Ver people. I mean, I just remember these old uh, Michael and Dean. I mean, we were all in class together. No one had anything at the time, right? So it's really interesting to see the paths that everyone has taken, right? Like Michael and Dean. I mean, look, at he's doing a lot of stuff, right? And just everybody kind of grew, I think. The people who were really in it grew. I mean, I grew, but not. I don't feel like I personally grew in the 
Oregon industry because I branched out into the competition world and and more so that than making winemaking my full 100% make a living, you know. So, but I see it all, you know. I, I see it all, and I've seen it all, right? Um, I've seen it all change. Just you know, the money come through and. Like I worked for, I did work for Lynn Penner Ash too, just on events. I just helped them with some events. And I remember one time it was really funny. I was still doing Madonna at the time, and they were, and she's like, she said, um, they were like, oh, Andrea's a Madonna impersonator. She's like, Madonna impersonator? Why would anyone want to see? Like, what does she do as Madonna? Like, does she stand around and pray? Like, she thought it was Madonna, like Mother of God, or whoever that Madonna is. <laughs> that was Lynn Penneras. They're like, no, 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 the other Madonna. And then like 10 years later, I hired my friend for her 50th birthday. I hired my friend who's a, a Lady Gaga impersonator. They flew her in from Las Vegas. She performed at her 50th birthday. Um, but that was, you know, great to see like what their transformation, right? Lynn Penneras. Good for them. Good for her. Hard work. I, I just remember her from the Indie Wine Festival judging. She was always a technical standout. She would always say, no, this one's flawed. I'm not moving it on. She was really, and I remember, oh, wow, you know, so I was so new then. That was just my first thing, volunteering. Like, oh, that was so, you know, I've got to listen to this lady. She sounds like she knows what she's talking about. You know, she did. And look at her, you know. Um, so that was kind of cool to see the process of that, right? When these people were just... She was a judge at the Indie Wine Festival and all the people that were in the Indie Wine Festival. It seems like most of those people still are indie. You know, no one ever, except like Michael and Dean. But you now his label, well, I don't know about how big his label is anymore, but I know he's doing big stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's been fun to see the transition, right, and the growth. I'm not like an old, old timer, right, like the old guys, but I was still relatively got into the, mm -hmm. got into it, you know, in 2005. It's a lot of growth. You know, it's a, yeah, a lot of growth, right. Yeah, I'm kind of glad I'm not actually in the valley in that zone. I don't know. I, you know. So what, what comes next for Oregon from your perspective? What do you see the industry looking like over the next few years? What changes do you see? Or what are you hoping for? Um, I mean, well, I don't know if for Oregon specifically. Um, I mean, I see trends, you know, like, Unfortunately, young people aren't drinking as much. But I think I see a trend toward, and I like the idea of these piquettes and pet nats and the lighter alcohol stuff. Um, and I, I make a pet nat at home, just my summer drinking wine. Um, I bleed off my, I do a senye in my cab. So I have three, three, five, 15 gallons of cab I make into, a, into a, my summer sparkling wine, just in my garage. So I drink it all summer. Um, and I like it, you know, I'm like, oh, this is good shit, you know? So I, I see like the lighter alcohol being a trend and being successful. I, I have a little bit of a worry for traditional classic wines. I feel almost like it's a fading thing. I don't know why I think that. Maybe because everyone's saying, oh, young people aren't drinking. I'm like, oh, not, okay, because they're going toward these other orange wines and low alcohol wines. I don't want the great wines to get lost, you know. Um, I don't think they will in my lifetime, but I don't know, you know. It's a thought, right? It's a thought, like, maybe young people won't appreciate this incredible cab from the rocks that makes this really amazing, structured, interesting, mineral-driven Cabernet. It's so fantastic, you know. Maybe they'll never appreciate that. I don't know. Tell me what's next for you personally, anything personally, professionally that you're looking ahead to. It's a little hard because my partners are a little older. They weigh, they teeter back and forth when running to like wind down or ramp up, you know? Guy, everyone's like, oh, do we want to slow down? Do I? I would love, I'm Portuguese, I'm a Portuguese national. I would love to make an Oregon Turiga Nacional. And for me personally, that would be like my dream to make that wine. Um, they have some in Southern Oregon. It has to be Oregon because we're all Oregon. Mm -hmm. So Southern Oregon would, that's the only place I know they grow it. Uh, it's very, they grow a small amount and it's always spoken for. So I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that. But um, that's kind of one thing I want to do is add, add something like that, a different 
read that I, I mean, I know I could make a great wine out of it because I know my heart and my passion for that, to make that Portuguese grape is there. Um, and I just want to keep making my cabs um, and Riesling. I mean, I'm interested, I think, maybe in doing a, some sort of pet nat Riesling eventually. I'd like to do that. Um, maybe bring back the piquette. It's hard to do when I'm with my, I also have another software job. <laughs> it's not wine related. Same boss, not wine related. Um, and I want to retire from that in a few years and that will give me a lot more time. So maybe in a couple more years, I can really focus more on just doing wine. I don't ever want to make more than, I don't ever want to make more than 300 cases. So it would be more just about doing, personally making a great wine from a Portuguese grape in Oregon and continuing to make great cabs and Riesling. Love it. All the questions that I have for you today, anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything we didn't cover today, that you'd like to cover? I don't think so. Don't get shy on us now. <laughs> I think I told you probably too much. <laughs> That's sort of how it goes usually. So, well, thank you very much for taking the time, sharing your story. Thanks for having me. Thank you to the people of Portland Wine Stores for letting us use their space. Again, I feel like we're like, we should be renting a space here, how often we're here. Thank you. That's for right, my husband owns it. <laughs> <laughs> this one's on the house. Excellent. Thank you so much. We'll let you off the hook.